Hello, and welcome to What Comes to Mind, Season 2 of The Psychonaut Show. This is John K. Burton, MD, psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and your host on this podcast that brings ideas from the history of psychoanalysis to solve problems in everyday life. In this episode, we're going to explore the eight stages of man. Now, sometimes people want to know, why do patients come and see me? In fact, my doctor, every time I go to see him for my annual checkup, always says, so what are people coming in for these days? And he's just trying to make small talk and probably wants me to say something about the rates of anxiety and depression. But what I really want to tell him is people come in because of blocks in the eight stages of man. Now, that really isn't a medical kind of topic or really even a psychiatric one. And I don't know if my primary care doctor really wants to hear about that. But the Psychonaut Show, and if he listens, he'll understand this better, is about applying these ideas from psychoanalysis to everyday life to see that they actually are very relevant. And that's what we're going to get into today. The Eight Stages of Man is a concept that was developed by Eric Erickson, and I'm going to tell you about Eric Erickson a little bit later, but I just want to tell you quickly that the eight stages of man sets out each stage of life as a task that has to be accomplished and solved in order to move on to the next one. I sort of think of it as like the 12 labors of Hercules. It sets forth the task that must be accomplished in each of the eight stages. Now, for an example, I'm going to tell you about a woman who came to me in her late 20s, and we're going to focus in this episode on the last four of the eight stages. The first four really are about childhood, then the fifth is adolescence, and the last three have to do with adulthood. But this stage of, you know, the 20-something has come into prominence lately. There's this idea in the field, and even popularly about the idea of the emerging adult as a new developmental phase. And on the flip side, this idea of failure to launch. Look, many young men who should be able to move out simply can't. It's called failure to launch. And that's where I come in. Young men develop... I investors. find these terms kind of annoying and, and patronizing. You know, this is sort of saying somebody is an emerging adult is saying they're not quite an adult yet, which may be accurate descriptively, but I don't think it does justice to the idea of growth and development. David Brooks a while ago wrote an article in the New York Times suggesting a new name that we call that this period of life the Odyssey years. The Odyssey years are about exploring things, trying to find one's place in the world. Uh, like Odysseus did in the Odyssey. And I think that's a much better description of what that period of time is all about. You may have heard about that guy up in uh, upstate New York who was living in his parents' basement and they tried to evict him and he sued them and all of this sort of thing. This is very clearly an example of somebody who has a block in this period of time, which we're going to call approximately the stage six of the eight stages of man. But let me give you a real life example that I know about. So a woman who had just completed her residency in pediatrics came to me because she was having enormous anxiety about actually getting a job. She'd been a student and a trainee for so long and was very comfortable and good with that. But now it was time to really get a job and think about a real career that would carry her well into her adulthood. And she was having panic attacks, couldn't even think about what this was going to be like, and really interfering her ability to even think about what job she wanted, let alone apply and do a good interview. And she was also worried about becoming a mother. She had met a very good and supportive husband who was really a good match for her and and definitely wanted to have children. But the idea of now being ready to really, really frightened her. 
So since we're talking about development in the eight stages of man, it's important to understand something about this woman's development, as it always is, really. That's the point of this episode, is that development, even into adulthood, is so important. And so in this woman's story, it's important to know that she was born in Korea and grew up in Korea. Uh, she grew up in a fairly traditional family uh, with traditional roles for men and women, a high emphasis on education for all of them. And in particular, her mother was very strict with her, had very high expectations, and she often felt that her mother was very critical of her and never felt like she could do right in terms of how she looked and her weight and who she hung out with and, and how she dressed and all this sort of thing. So she decided to go to college in the U.S. and she came here and went to college and she could have rebelled even more. But this idea of leaving Korea and her family and her community and her mother in particular and coming to the U.S. was a very big deal. One that she only kind of realized what a big deal it was in terms of the task of stage five in particular, that task of identity consolidation. Only, you know, as she began to talk about it and kind of reflect on it and what it really meant. And some of her peers in the Asia society rebelled even more. They dyed their hair red and they dated white boys and a couple of them got tattoos, but she would never do that kind of thing. Now, that's what Anna Freud called this sort of really rebelling adolescent turmoil, Anna Freud called it. And she said that there are problems later in life if you don't see it. Now, that theory has been argued with, but it seems to me like there's a lot to it. And our friend Clarice Kustenbaum actually wrote an article called The Role of Fairy Tales in Female Development, where she looks at fairy tales, and much as Joseph Campbell does in terms of the hero's journey, Dr. Kestenbaum looks at it in terms of how women develop. And she talks about stories such as The Goose Girl or another story, Po Dan, which is French for donkey skin. And if you can find the movie with uh, Catherine Deneuve, it's called uh, Donkey Skin. It's a beautiful example of this particular form of fairy tale. Le cake d'amour. And what it shows is that the girls, and Dr. Kestenbaum's theory, is that girls have to transform themselves in ways that are often bizarre or off-putting in adolescence. And I'm sure we all kind of have a sense, including adolescent girls, have a sense of what that's like with the different hairstyles. Certainly in the 80s, it was about, you know, pink hair and different styles and ripped jeans and, you know, sort of looking like you've been through the apocalypse. But every generation has its version of this. And the idea is that I have to do this in order to separate myself from my family and figure out who I am. But the role of rebellion comes first. Well, anyway, this girl's, uh, you know, as a girl, this woman's uh, adolescence was marked simply by leaving the country. And that was it. And afterwards, when she came here, she was a very good student, was pre-med, did very well, got into one of the top medical schools, really studied and decided that she really wanted to treat children and help them and help them in ways that they had missed out on in their childhood. And in the process of conversing about this with me, understanding that part of that was a feeling of what she didn't get in childhood. And she wasn't deprived materially, but she felt like she was deprived of certain things emotionally in terms of connection and particularly in terms of self-esteem as a child that she was motivating her to go through her training, her education, do well, and become a pediatrician. So this woman had a conflict in her development. And understanding this through the help of understanding the idea of the eight stages of man helped her to move on. So let's get a little bit into the theory. So I'm going to go through each of the eight stages and give you the theme of each of them. The first stage is what Erickson called hope. And the challenge here is between basic trust and mistrust. This is the first stage of life. This is infancy. This is equivalent to Freud's oral stage, but it really emphasizes 
the sense of being able to trust other people, to trust the world that our needs are going to be met. And if we have a problem in this phase, then we're going to bring that sense of mistrust, sense of, I don't know that my needs are going to be met. I don't know that I can rely on other people. I'm going to carry that through and it's going to affect me in every other task that awaits me at other stages of life. And the same thing is true for any problem at any stage of life. It affects the stages later on. The second stage is will. And the task here is between autonomy and doubt. And this is equivalent to Freud's anal stage. And, you know, people make fun of Freud's oral, anal, you know, Oedipal. But the idea, I think, of having a theme, and Erickson really adds to this, helps us think more practically about actually what's going on here. And the stage of will, the second stage or the anal stage, is the stage of toilet training. What's toilet training about? It's about I can do things or I refuse to do things. It's showing myself for the very first time in life as being able to say what I want, which may be in opposition to what the world, which is the parents in this case, the world wants from me. And the downside of this, the challenge to be overcome, according to Erickson, is doubt. If you don't manage this stage of life, which is, you know, around two, two or three, then you bring this sense of doubt, not being sure of yourself, not knowing your own needs and and wishes, um, always kind of deferring to the other or needing to rebel, you know, just being stuck in that area. The third stage, which would correspond to the Oedipal stage, Erickson calls purpose, and it's initiative versus guilt. This is where I am going to be motivated to get something, and if you put it in Oedipal terms, it's the person that I want, uh, and I'm going to beat the other person, versus guilt, which you can understand in an Oedipal context, it's I feel bad about what I want, and problems here, and we've talked about this in the Oedipal complex, have to do with the ability to feel like I'm okay with what I want and I've managed my guilt. The fourth stage is equivalent to what Freud called latency, which is school age, basically from seven to ten, like seven until, when, when school starts until puberty begins. It's that stage. He called it latency because the idea was that the libido goes underground. We now think that that doesn't really happen, but but there are certain tasks. And again, Erickson really helped us to think about what are the tasks of this phase. And he called it competency. And the task is industry versus inferiority. It's finding my place. And in, in school, it's, well, you know, before computers, it was penmanship and kickball. And even though technology may have changed and there may be other things that are more important, though, honestly, I'm really amazed at how much schools still think penmanship is important. But it's the idea that I'm good at something. I have a place in the world. I, I work. I know what I do. A, a supervisor of mine said the, the task of this phase is to be a good little citizen. And on the flip side, not feeling good, feeling like you're a loser, feeling like you're not picked for the team. Like this is very, this is what the world is, is important. Of course, later in life, you learn it's not all about that, but this is the task of this phase. And sort of knowing what your job is, knowing how to find it, being able to do it, feeling competent about it, hugely important, of course. And that is the task of that phase of life. Next comes adolescence, which is obviously very important, and we're going to talk a lot about that in the case, but also, you know, we just think about it so much these days, and there are many theorists, including Anna Freud, who've thought about adolescence on itself a lot. You know, Freud didn't so much. In fact, the famous case of Dora, which one day we'll do a podcast episode on Dora, because there's just so much there between Dora and Freud, and how he failed miserably treating her and, and what he learned that was, you know, central to how we do psychoanalysis today. Well, Dora was 18 when she went to see Freud, and 16 
when the events that brought her to see him happened. And he didn't think of her as an adolescent. He thought of her as an adult, and he treated her like an adult and interpreted to her as an adult. And it's like, no wonder it didn't go well, because that's not where she was at. And what Erickson said is the task of this phase is what he called fidelity. And that's kind of a difficult term. It means not in a romantic or sexual way, but in a way of towards oneself. The task is identity consolidation, and the downside is role or identity confusion. I don't know who I am. I've consolidated my idea of myself. I do know who I am. That's what fidelity is. I am a thing, and I. it's what today they call like brand integrity, like every person is a brand. And some psychoanalysts I know think this is just terrible and it's capitalism and it's, you know, making people commodities, but really they're just different words. And when the millennials talk about brand integrity on social media, maybe there are some problems, but re they really are talking about fidelity, fidelity to one's identity. And that's the task of adolescence. It's hugely important. And I would say that's maybe the most important thing that I do in, in my practice working with young people is figure out these conflicts in Erickson stage five. Then we come to the three stages of adulthood. And this is where Erickson really made a huge contribution because this is the idea that we develop into adulthood, that we're not done when adolescence is done, that there are still tasks to be accomplished. And the first task of the adult years is what he calls love. And that is, the task is between intimacy and isolation. And his emphasis really is on relationships, developing meaningful relationships in love, but also in work, adult relationships that are going to be important now that one has decided who one is. Maybe they will be, and often they are, with people from earlier stages, from school, from earlier. I mean, I know people who've, have their best friend still from kindergarten, but it has to have survived that relationship up to this phase when the task is really about those relationships. Now, Erickson emphasizes relationships, love in this phase. You know, and I think in our lives, the idea of who am I as a person with a job? Where do I fit in society as a worker? Um, whether one has a job or not, but like the idea of purpose really is very important, sort of earlier than the 20s. Or, and, and this is the idea of development, that it doesn't really go one than the other. There's sort of a melding into one another and they fold one into the other. And so the seventh phase is what he calls care, which is the task of generativity versus stagnation. Generativity meaning yeah, you can have children, but that's not the only way to be generative. If you don't have children, obviously you haven't failed in stage seven. It's about creating things that are more than you, that are going to be of use in the world or just in the world that you have created versus stagnation, which I'm you know, obviously I'm just stuck. I don't feel like I'm creating anything. Then the final stage, and like I said, love and care kind of overlap, in my opinion, a lot. And then the final stage is wisdom. And the task here is between integrity and despair. And integrity is one that I have a little bit of difficulty understanding. I really think of it as wisdom and despair. Wisdom being, I understand at the end of life, wherever you define that, that again, they bleed into each other, but definitely when you get into your 60s and as somebody in my 50s, I'm beginning to kind of feel this call of the tension between wisdom on the one side and despair, and I see it in my peers. There's the idea like life, you know, has a cycle, it's short, I have my place, I've done what I can, and you know, and then it, and then it goes on. There are a couple of movies that I just quote constantly, and The Lion King is one of them, and it's important because it's the circle of life. Now that's what stage eight, the, well, that's what all the stages are, but stage eight is really about the circle of life and accepting that. And despair, and I just see this so much in so many people who are, you know, as the Buddhists say, it's abhinivesa, which is the fear of death is the cause of all human suffering. 
that we can't handle this. We, we didn't, we focus on what we didn't get out of life and, and the things that we're never going to have. And it creates this sense of despair and hopelessness and despondency. That is the task of the final stage of men, according to Erickson. So now that we've gone through all of the eight stages and see how they mold into one another and create this circle of life, let's think about how this can apply to our patient and how it helped her to think about her situation. She was having terrible anxiety about leaving her education and going into a job, a career of her own, of helping children grow, of creating her own family and having her own children. And she was almost unable to kind of think about how to approach this, despite all of her training and all of her, uh, you know, obvious preparedness. Now, in stage six, the stage of love, she had been lucky enough to find someone who was a very good match for her. He happened to be a man who had come from Korea himself. He was part of the community. And he presented to her a wonderful solution of somebody who respected her for who she was and how she had come up in the world and yet was also a way to remain connected to her traditions and what was important to her. So she didn't have problems in stage six, that stage of love, intimacy versus isolation. She had this romantic relationship and she had friends and, and she was very connected in the world. But in the beginning to approach that seventh stage of care where we become generative in the world, this is where she really got hit and had to stop. And we looked back at her life and saw that she had had a conflict in the stage five of fidelity, identity. She had never fully claimed her own identity and dealt with the challenges of that phase, which have to do not only with rebelling, like Clarice talks about with the goose girl, but also of sort of mourning that one is not going to have one's parents, whether they disapprove or approve, and one has to become one's own person. There was work left to be done of that phase for her as she moved into this phase of generativity. And what she said was that she realized that she had an illusion of childhood, a, a fantasy of what it meant to be an adult, that she would be a mother that would be better than her own mother. And this came out of conversation. It wasn't something that she was aware of completely consciously, but she became aware of it as she talked about it. And she said that she had this idea that she would be not only someone who could fix things and provide what she didn't get, but also that she could give what she didn't get. And she realized that she might never be able to give everything that she wanted to give, that as a pediatrician, she could only give what she had to give and that some children would continue to suffer. And that even as a mother, she might not be able to ensure that her children wouldn't be sad from time to time in the way that she was. And she realized that that was part of her identity consolidation. It was very important. And that letting go of that allowed her to move into this new phase of life where she could accept a job that she was excited about knowing that she didn't have to live up to this identity from an earlier period. And similarly with the idea of having her own children. The way that she put it was, before, before my, my independence, independence from, from my parents, parents was it was more, more about, about the material too. world. When she's talking about adolescence, it's very concrete, you know, being, being self-sufficient, self that I, I pay for things myself, myself that I live, I live in my, my own space, space that, that I have, have my, my education. education. That was a lot for her, even though she wasn't doing uh, what her friends did with her appearance, even though she looked on the outside like she was, you know, a good traditional Korean girl. She, on the inside, felt like she was making a big leap towards independence. And she said in her late 20s, it was more, it was more about, about emotional independence. independence. It was about, as she said, a higher, a higher level, level of questioning my life, my relationships, my relationships to my, to my parents, parents and why I get wound up by, by them, and that she had now understood her relationships and her life goals. So she was dealing with the task of sage 
seven, but it was because of her past experiences that were affecting her and causing her to have trouble navigating it. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Eric Erickson himself, because we talk about these characters on The Psychonaut Show, and it's sometimes just as interesting as the cases themselves that we apply their concepts to. And I sort of wanted to call this an Eric by any other name, because he comes by his contributions to the study of adult identity and development, honestly, in terms of his own life. So Eric Erickson is what I call the second generation after Freud. His mentor was actually Anna Freud. I, sometimes I think of the psychoanalysts as like the vampires, like in Interview with the Vampire, the, the very original one that, that we get to in Queen of the Damned, the Anne Rice novels, is Akasha from Egypt. She's the first vampire. And I think of Freud as sort of like the first one and then everyone gets analyzed by someone else and that's their parent that's the one that made them into a psychoanalyst and it goes on and on and on and on so erickson is the two generations after freud there's freud then anna and then erickson and he actually died only in 1994 which to me isn't that long ago that's when i graduated from medical school and to think that erickson was alive all while i was in medical school is kind of amazing because he's a historical figure but as i said his study of adult identity comes to him honestly from his own personal experience his mother was from a prominent jewish family in copenhagen but she had an affair with an unknown Dane. So Erickson's father is not known, but he was not Jewish. He was Danish. And his mother had Eric out of wedlock and she ran away from her family and from her husband. And he was given, when he was born, he was given her married name, Eric Solomson. Uh, but she raised him herself and she also studied to become a nurse. And then she married Eric's pediatrician who was a Dr. Homburger, and he became Eric Homburger. And at school, when he finally was grown up and went to school, he was mocked for his identity by Jews earlier in his development in, in Hebrew school, presumably, for being you know tall and blonde and, and blue-eyed and looking like a Dane. And then when he went to um, school later on, he was mocked by the Gentiles for having a Jewish mother and a Jewish name and, and for being a Jew, basically. And so we see that Erickson had an identity crisis. And in fact, the idea of the identity crisis was Erickson's. That was one of his major contributions to the field. Now, later in life, when he grew up, his family wanted him to go to medical school and kind of follow down that traditional path, you know, much like my patient who went down a traditional path and then needed to figure out who she was. And he decided he wasn't going to do that. He was more openly rebellious and he had an affinity for art. He was very good at it. And he basically decided to bum around Europe with his friend Peter Blos. I decided not to go to university. I'm going to bum around Europe, experimenting with drugs. <laughs> Learning for denim, for as long as it's fashionable. And then take a flat in Paris. Just be a famous artist. So thanks, Julio, for finding that clip from my favorite sitcom again. Absolutely fabulous with the uh, famous Helena Bonham Carter. At any rate, back to Erickson. He was traveling around Europe, teaching art, doing art with his friend Peter Bloss, who also became a very important psychoanalyst in the study of adolescence. So Erickson met the Freuds actually through Peter Bloss, and he began teaching art at the Burlingham School, which was a school created by the Burlingham family, who were wealthy Americans who had come to Europe. And as we talked about in the Anna Freud episode, Dorothy, their daughter, became very good friends with Anna. Some say they were lovers. We don't know that part. But at any rate, this was before they escaped to London and founded the War Nurseries. Uh, Eric was teaching at the Burlingham School with Anna Freud, and he was taken under the wing of Anna and, and her family and Sigmund Freud as well. And he was also mentored by a couple of other important 
analysts who eventually came to America, and um, they were Heinz Hartmann and August Eichhorn. August Eichhorn also became very important in studying development, particularly juvenile delinquency. Erickson, too, eventually came to America, and he taught at Yale. He finished his psychoanalytic training, never went to medical school. He was a lay analyst, and he changed his name to Erickson. So basically, he is Eric, son of Eric. He reinvented himself completely. This Jewish guy kind of gave himself this Viking name, and apparently his children liked it very much because they would no longer be made fun of, not for being Jews, but for having the last name Hamburger in America. So that's how Erickson, that's sort of his origin story. He took the study of the ego, which is the I, das Ich, and he took it to the next level. So Freud was really looking at drive development, and Erickson said, let's look at the ego. How does the ego develop? And it develops not just through childhood and libidinal stages in adolescence, but all the way to the adulthood all the way through adulthood and all the way to the end of life. He also really recognized the importance of the impact of society on the individual. It was the first place where interest was not just in the drives like Freud and Klein and the family like Winnicott and Anna Freud, but also in society itself, the larger world. So he made some very important contributions. So I want to tell you about another case that shows us how Eric Erickson's concept of the eight stages of man can be very helpful. This is a story about a woman who came to me at the age of 92. Now you might think, what is a child psychiatrist doing talking to somebody in their 90s? And the way that I think about it is, you know, we look at children and get to see them develop, unfold, toddler becoming a school-age child who becomes an adolescent, who becomes an adult. It's like seeing how things move through time. And that's something that happens all throughout life. Development is a way we have of looking at people. And Eric Erickson really brought that into adulthood with his idea of the eight stages of man. But let's go back to this case. So this woman had never had psychotherapy in her life and never felt a need to. She was sort of what I thought as a fancy Upper East Side lady. But what had happened was, is six months prior to coming to see me, she had been knocked over in a mugging and had been bruised pretty badly and had become very fearful, afraid to go out in her neighborhood that she had lived most all of her life, really all of her adult life. And she had become very irritable and fearful and was being difficult with the family. Now they brought her for therapy before for a course of cognitive behavior therapy for trauma. And she didn't like it, didn't like talking about what had happened to her and really didn't want to do the strategies and didn't want to change her mindset. So they brought her to see me. And she didn't particularly feel like I was going to be helpful either, but she said, well, well I don't, I don't mind, mind talking, talking to Dr. Burton, Burton and, he's and he's not, not too, too hard, hard to look, look at, at, which was very nice of her to say, though that was a while ago and I now have a lot more white hair than I did. And as we got to talking, I learned more about her, of course, and she was a woman who had a very interesting history after we got below the surface of her sort of New York City demeanor. She actually was born in the Ukraine. She was Jewish, and her family suffered terrible abuses. Uh, an aunt of hers was killed by a pogrom in the Ukraine at the hands of the Tatars, and she, as a young girl, fled to New York City, and she worked very hard in her education, and at that time was able to come up through the city college education system and did very well. She met a man and fell in love. They got married, and together they founded a very successful business, and they were pretty well known in their society. She loved entertaining and she had children and grandchildren and she was very proud and active in, in her community and in her synagogue. And she just never really felt a need to reflect inwardly. She had overcome great odds early in life. 
was very successful, had a good family, and basically had everything that she wanted. This was sort of the things that we learned as we talked and we reflected on the meaning that some of these past experiences might have on her current experience of being so afraid and not wanting to go out and, and being quite angry. And that in a way the meaning was that she was once again in a hostile environment with dangers all around where she had worked so hard to get away from that. And that would be a more typical psychoanalytic interpretation of, of the events relating them to the past. But what the eight stages of man, what development helped us with at this woman who is really at the very end of her development was to understand the reality that there was a task at hand, not a task of the past, but a task at hand. And that was this stage eight of wisdom versus despair. And really when she came to see me, she was in a state of despair. Eventually she was too frail to come to my office, but I would visit her in her apartment about once a month. It was the only uh, home visit I've ever done, it, but it was worth the uh, experience to travel over there. And a colleague of mine said, well, they say that time goes faster as you age, so she probably feels like she's in a five times a week analysis. And she did make use of it and did reflect inwardly like an analysis, no matter how frequent it was or wasn't. And one time she brought to me a dream and she said, and this was somebody who never thought about her dreams as being important or not. And she said, I, I had, had a dream about, about my husband, my husband and he took, he took me to, me to a, a restaurant, restaurant but the, the restaurant, restaurant wasn't, wasn't a nice restaurant. restaurant. And, and I, I said, said why, why would you take, take me to a restaurant like this? this? And he said to her in the dream, because I don't love you anymore. And we realized that she had been thinking about her husband quite a bit and the idea that she would soon be joining him in death. She said, well, I don't particularly like, like this world, world but, but I'm, I'm in no, no hurry, hurry to, to leave, leave it. it. But she was thinking about her connections to her family, her connections to her husband, and we sort of thought of this dream as a fear of leaving them behind, of being without love. We thought that this was the task of this time of life, to reflect on what her life had been and to find some kind of wisdom in it. Now, I don't know if this was the right or wrong interpretation of the dream, but it seemed to help her. The family wrote to me when she died, and I wrote back, and I told them how I too had learned something, how I had developed from working with somebody at that stage of life, which was pretty unusual for me, but I very much saw it as part of my work in development. And you know, it makes me think too about... Um, the concepts in Ayurvedic medicine, which in, in Ayurvedic medicine, the traditional medicine of India, there isn't a division between mind and body. It's, it's all one. And everything is seen as a cycle. The, the day is divided in, into a cycle. The, the seasons, the year is, is flows in a cycle. And they say that life too flows in a cycle. And the last stage of life is the one that is associated with the dosha vata. And vata is basically air. And air is thought to be the one that circulates and is closest to the spirit. So it makes sense to me from that point of view, too, that this is the task of kind of allowing ourselves to become air and embrace what that is about and, and move on. So what is the lesson here? It's about development. Development allows us to look at people like a film rather than just a snapshot. For example, in the case of the first person, the pediatrician to be, we could see her as having a block in a particular point in her life journey. And similarly with the woman that I just was talking about, rather than just seeing her as somebody who had PTSD, and of course she did have some elements of PTSD, as did the first woman have some elements of, of panic and, and generalized anxiety disorder, but these diagnoses don't do justice to what's going on in the whole life and seeing a person's life like the unfolding of a film, not just one little picture. In Erickson's model, it's really not with completion. It goes on and on until the end. It's sort of like thinking of, you know, the stages of a butterfly's life cycle. There's the egg, and then there's the caterpillar, and then there's the chrysalis, and then the butterfly, and then you're done. 
But in Erickson's model, it's like then there's something else and something else and something else. It's like Pokemon, you know. Each thing becomes yet another thing. And another thing that I think is an important takeaway from these ideas of the eight stages of man is that each stage of life is kind of like a culture. like It's like a foreign country that we have to understand on its own terms in order to understand the person who's in that stage of life. And that can help us to understand each other. The child going through his terrible twos isn't just a kid going through his terrible twos, but he's trying to deal with something in his own language. And there's a task at hand, just like the rebellious adolescent has a task and somebody who's despairing at the end of their life, they have a task too. Each one has a different language and a different worldview that goes with it. Each stage represents a mission, mission if you, you choose, choose to, to accept, accept it. it. The state will self-destruct in five seconds. Uh, for those of you who are alive in the 1970s. And it's a journey that goes forward all the way to the end. As it says in the prophet, and when the earth shall claim your limbs, then shall you truly dance. This is Dr. JKB signing off. Since we are exploring together, you make the journey all the richer by subscribing to the show on iTunes. And even better, if you also leave a rating, it helps others to find us. If you have a story about how the concept in this episode helped you figure out something in your life, send it in, please. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter at Psychonaut Show. Show notes are on the website, thepsychonautshow.com. And if you leave me a question, it may well be an inspiration for an upcoming episode. Until our next trip, judge nothing, question everything. And remember, there's always a reason. Bye for now. All the patient stories presented on The Psychonaut Show are created by me to illustrate an idea. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The Psychonaut Show was created and produced by yours truly, John Burton. Art and web design by Hunter Creative. Post-production and sound design by Julio Gonzalez of Zimmer Media. Zimmer Media can be found online at zimmer.co. That's X-I-M-E-R dot C-O. 